It's July 25th, 1966, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Aria, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. At the 2012 London Olympics, Chinese swimmer Sun Yang won gold in the 1500 meter freestyle, swimming at a rate of 1.722 meters per second. Pretty impressive. Not as impressive as Mao Zedong, who swam nine miles down the Yangtze River in an astonishing 3.842 metres per second, and Mao was 72 at the time of this incredible feat, which definitely actually happened, as reported on this day, on every front page in China. And to give you a sample of the kind of reporting we have from the time, and here's a completely impartial report from the Peking New China News Agency's International Service. <laughs> it said, The happy news about Chairman Mao's latest swim in the Yangtze soon spread through Wuhan. The whole of the triple city was overjoyed as the news passed from one person to another. Everyone was saying, Our respected and beloved leader, Chairman Mao, is in such wonderful health. This is... I just, sorry, I just can't take it seriously. This is the greatest happiness for the entire Chinese people and for the revolutionary people throughout the world. I just love that that's what everyone was saying. They really over it. They could have made the dialogue a bit more believable. Well, it was ridiculed in the Western media at the time as well. But the point is that it was reported in the Western media. One of the few times that Wuhan was mentioned in the Western media until 2020. Yeah. Because whether or not you thought that the publicity opportunity had been massaged into a piece of blatant propaganda, which clearly seems to be the case now, the facts clearly were because because there was photographic evidence that Chairman Mao had swam a portion of the Yangtze River. Observers had seen him in there for 65 minutes. He may not have traversed nine miles in that time. But nonetheless, it would be a fair interpretation, therefore, that his health, Mm. which had been a matter of speculative interest all around the world, was in better shape than people had thought. So, you know, yes, that was obviously the message of this rather crude publicity stunt, Let's stick Chairman Mao in the river and show everyone what a strong swimmer he is. But it was also true that he was a strong swimmer, and indeed, he was on his way back. Yeah, and this was all very carefully orchestrated to be a reenactment of something that he had done 10 years earlier. As a kind of publicity stunt, he had swum the Pearl River, the Zhang River and the Yangtze, despite the misgivings of advisors and his security staff, because some of the rivers were actually quite polluted and they were like, mm, maybe don't. He did seem to enjoy the experience. He wrote a poem about it afterwards. It was called Swimming. An excerpt <laughs> from that went, Now I am swimming across the Great Yangtze, looking afar to the open sky of Chu, which is what um, Hubei province is sometimes called. Let the wind blow and waves be better far than idly strolling in a courtyard and everyone said that's the best poem i've ever heard long live chairman now <laughs> well and so this very conscious reenactment of that 1956 stunt was supposed to be reintroducing him as the public face of the chinese communist party asserting his health and vitality and kicking off the cultural revolution which was his big project to bring him back to power Well, yeah. So by this stage, he had been mostly removed from having any actual hand on Attila because uh, after the Great Leap Forward in 1958 to 60, that led to, you know, widespread famine and in which millions of people died. Just quick footnote for those who don't know what the Great Leap Forward is. The Great Leap Forward was like, let's mobilise the peasants, let's work them to the bone to make the country better but it didn't succeed in averting a famine that then claimed the lives of tens of millions of people. I mean, so much of it was connected directly to Mao as well. He'd been the public face, obviously, of the Great Leap Forward. And a lot of the ideas were his. They were these kind of harebrained, unproven agricultural reforms. So the main point of it was to make small holdings into big collective farms, the idea being that then all that excess peasant power could go towards industrial work. Because even though it's always associated with agriculture, it was actually about making China more industrialised. But what happened was that because the reforms were so disastrous, local officials, obviously operating in a very repressive system, felt the need to exaggerate their area's output under the new system. And so then the state would end up requisitioning an amount of grain for use in the cities based on that overblown total, which meant the peasants had nothing. And there were also just really bizarre things like Mao had this idea that sparrows were eating grain so there was this gigantic nationwide campaign to kill all the sparrows wow. you know, they were 
just everywhere being like, crush the sparrows. But what <laughs> happened then, as any agricultural scientist could probably have said, was that this led to locusts and other insects who would naturally be predated on by the sparrows feasting with total impunity, worsening the famine considerably. Eventually, China would import a quarter of a million sparrows from the USSR. Where is it? That's a great fact. <laughs> it was also this idea that you could do industrialization at a local level rather than at a sort of state level. So you didn't have to have massive smelting plants. You could do your smelting in your backyard, for example. <laughs> Again, just these sort of crazy harebrained ideas that were never going to work. But basically, the leaders who were now in place, Deng Xiaoping and Liu Xiaoqi, had massively disagreed with the policies and edged him off to the side. But he was still the figurehead of the revolution. And the Communist Party just was at this stage thinking, look, we've got him. He is a big deal to the people, but we just cannot weather any more errors on this scale. And it's actually notable that from 1981, the official view of Mao was that he was great, but you could subdivide him into this early good era and then this later bad era. And they confessed as of June 1981 that basically pretty much everything he said after 1957 was incorrect. Well, he was 72 years old at this point, And I wonder if these other people, senior people in the Communist Party, didn't really believe he had it in him to make a fully-fledged comeback. Maybe they did actually buy into this strategy of, you know, we need to do what Stalin did. You know, it's cult of personality. He could almost be a sort of cuddly mascot for communism if we do this right. And obviously we've cast a lot of scorn and mocking comments as to whether this actually happened in the way that it was laid out in the Chinese press. But in either way, it did have the desired impact. In either way, either he was a world record breaking swimmer that's never been bettered or he wasn't. In either case, let's be even handed. <laughs> I don't want to rule it out, you know. Sure. This yeah. is excellent journalism. <laughs> Precisely because Mao's public role had been downplayed a lot, he hadn't been seen in public very often, but must have been a genuine surprise, you know, when he made this unexpected appearance at this yearly race across the Yangtze, taking place near Wuhan. There were about 5,000 people participating. And this is according to the Chinese state news agency Xinhua, said... He appeared on the dock with glowing ruddy cheeks and in buoyant spirits. The swimmers, who were carrying red flags and pushing along huge placards inscribed with quotations from Chairman Mao's works, formed a great wall on the surface of the river. Well, I would take those 20 swimming races. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, good job that you brought your gigantic placard inscribed with quotations from Mao along, and then he makes a surprise appearance. There were some other bits that I loved that he during the swim, he also was exchanging jokes with people, and he also taught a woman how to do backstroke. You're like, listen, it's heroic enough. You don't also need to <laughs> be like the nation's swim coach <laughs> but the nation's dad was obviously very clearly the message wasn't it and you know it's his physical strength but also the 5,000 people swimming behind him who yeah. as you say Rebecca were there anyway it was Mao showing that he was robust enough to do this sort of physical activity but also literally he was swimming in the direction of the seat of power in Beijing you know he was <laughs> off living in Shanghai by now and here he was coming back and what follows is the formation of the Red Guard and the publication of the Little Red Book and then Mao starts hosting rallies of millions of supporters in Tiananmen Square and around the place and then you start to have the dark side of the Cultural Revolution. Wait, I feel like that was already dark. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you were like, it wasn't all good things like the formation of the Red right. Guards. Well, what I was specifically thinking of was the denunciation rallies and the power grabs for local government and party branches. And the destruction of all traditional culture and history generally something we should frown upon, I feel. This is another bad bit. It's, there's, <laughs> there's a few bad bits. And demonstrating his vitality as he did on the swim across the Yangtze was really important because Mao was specifically targeting the younger generations. The older mm. generations, you know, they had seen the result of his policies. They were getting a little bit fed up with him. The older leaders in the Communist Party were trying to sideline him. So he went straight to the young people, urging them to rise up and overthrow bourgeois elements that could be in their schools, their universities, workplaces, local governments. And in Mao's case, it was basically turning around to all of the old guys who had come up with him in the Communist Party and purging them. At which point, and returning back to power, he then moves into his official residence in Zhongnanhai that housed an indoor swimming pool, and he then swam every day for the rest of his life. 
And it wasn't only on the domestic stage that Mao was able to use his proficiency in swimming. He was also using it in international diplomacy. There was this incredible account of a meeting he had with Nikita Khrushchev in 1958. And the Soviet leader was a former miner. He was not a strong swimmer. This is a little bit like what Putin used to do with Angela mm. Merkel with dogs. Mao knew that Khrushchev was not a keen swimmer. So he invited him to continue their talks at Mao's private pool in his house. And so what <laughs> happened was they got changed into their swimming gear and apparently Khrushchev accidentally got given ones that didn't fit him very well. And so Mao was swimming lengths up and down while his interpreter jogged alongside translating what he was saying to Khrushchev, who was splashing uncertainly in the shallow end of the pool. <laughs> First one to the end has to support the other person's economic policy. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow. This kind of legwork was completely unknown at the time. This was just not something that detectives did. Love the show? Support the show. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.